uh, Simon giving some theology. Um, it, uh, as Liz said, eight months ago, I started working for Tear Fund. Before that, I was a lecturer and was one of his lecturers in theology. So it's, it's good to see it's still there. Yeah, some of it's still there. It's, uh, it's great to see. Before we do anything else, what we're going to do is we're going to read from Scripture. So if you, can, if you have Bibles handy, could you turn to Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. I'm going to ask Karis, and I can't see where Karis is now sitting, uh, up at the back. Karis, can you come forward? Karis is going to read from Matthew chapter 25. It's a very familiar passage. Uh, but before she does, um, I don't need to introduce you, Karis, but there's a special reason why I've asked Karis to come up and, uh, and read this passage. Um, because, well, what happened last week, Karis? Um, I got a new job. Oh, what, what, what's your new job? Um, my new job is Admin and Communications Officer for Tier Fund. <laughs> so we're absolutely delighted to have Karis on board. So you're going to probably sort of hear a lot more about Tier Fund from Karis. If you've got any questions, you can go and ask Karis. Give her some time to get inducted and get to know us first. Uh, and, uh, but Karis, before you read, can I pray for you? Yeah. Actually, as you do that. Father, I just thank you for Karis. I thank you for the blessing that she is. And we do just ask that she takes on this new role, that you will use her in wonderful ways, that you'll speak through her, that you'll empower her, and that she will be a real witness to who you are. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, would you like to read Matthew chapter 25 for us? Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each according to his own ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who'd received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one who had the two talents gained two more. But the man who'd received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have... Even, when he has, even what he has will be taken from him. <clears throat> and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If Crossroads would like to come out, just now as well. Thank you, Karis. Thank you. I'm just going to drop this down. Well, this week for me has been full of highs and lows. One of the high points was knowing that Karis was going to be getting the job working for Tier Fund. I've known Karis for many years, so it was a delight to hear that. One of the low points was I was watching television and the advert came on. The one that we dread every year, well, I dread every year, the John Lewis advert that seems to signal the start of the Christmas preparations. Uh, and not only that, but it was surrounded by another 20 adverts or something like that. At least it felt like 20 of uh, trying to advertise and promote stuff for Christmas uh, and getting ready for Christmas and what is to go ahead. It's that point where we start thinking 
and planning for Christmas. Christmas is a joy, don't get me wrong, it is a joy. All the adverts aren't uh, in my head. I just, yeah, just don't enjoy them at all. It commercializes Christmas a bit more than what I would like. But we start in this season to start preparing and planning for Christmas. But all throughout our lives, we're actually preparing and planning what is about to happen. That's how we actually live our lives. Let me sort of just explain a little bit of the background behind uh, this passage, the parable of the talents. Whenever we read the parable of the talents, uh, what happens is that we normally read it just as we did just there. We read it as a parable in its own right. But actually, if you read around the parable, you soon discover that it was taught in that week from Palm Sunday to Good Friday in that period where Jesus had come down from Jerusalem and he was telling people a series of parables, every single one of them to do with planning for the future, preparing for the future. Will it be the parable of the 10 virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom to come? Will it be the parable of the wedding feast and how they responded to the master who invited them to this feast in the future? Whatever it is, every single one of them has a running thread about preparing and planning for the future. Whenever we look at the parable of the talents, we often don't think about that. We don't think about, actually, it's one about preparing for the future. But of course, that's exactly what it is. You've got three servants, each being given something and told to prepare for the master coming back. You've got one that is given five, who doubles it, who does whatever activity he does and actually is able to give the master back his five and five more. You've got one that's given two and been able to give back to the master two more. You've got a person who had one, who dug a hole in the ground, left it there, and then when the master came, dug it back up and gave him back the one. I first heard that parable as a child, I suppose most of you probably did as well, uh, and it was very much simplified uh, version of it, and it's the simplified version that tends to stick with most of us. But if you read it afresh as an adult, there are certain bits that stick out at you. And for me, that's been the case with this parable. As you read the parable, the first thing that struck me was, why is it? that it's the person with one who didn't invest? Why is it that it's the person who has only one talent who actually didn't manage to give back the master double? Why wasn't it the one with five? Why wasn't it the one with two? Why in particular was it the one? What are we being told here? My background, as I was saying, I I used to be a lecturer in in theology, but also community development. And my background is primarily working in community development uh, and youth work in areas of high deprivation, areas where actually people are struggling the most because they have least. People uh, who actually day to day is a struggle. Now I primarily do that in the UK. Now I work for Tear Fund and I'm actually involved in that in an international sphere as well. But One thing that I know from my own experience is of meeting people who don't have very much is that there's certain traits that they seem to have or gain from not having uh, much. If they don't have very much, if they have very little, you see a change in attitude, a change in their mindset. And that's very much the case in every single situation that I've come across. People who are poor or deprived, they start losing some of their self-esteem. They lose the confidence in themselves. They lose a little bit of who they are. They just have confidence that they'll actually be able to do anything. Their own value of themselves drops through the floor. They start worrying constantly. Worrying about everything. They worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, but actually quite often it's not even as far as that. They don't know what's going to happen later today. They worry about where the next meal's going to come from. They worry about actually what's the children going to ask for next. 
They start worrying almost constantly, and that plays on their mental health and who they are. And then they start looking around them and think, nobody cares. Nobody's out there looking at me and caring about what I'm about. Nobody cares about what I'm going through. Nobody notices me. I'm invisible. I'm not here. Nobody's bothered. And ultimately, they lose hope. And I think as Christians, people losing hope should be our greatest concern. If the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection isn't a story of hope, and if we as his people are not agents of hope, people who bring hope to this earth, then there's something wrong. We need to be those agents of hope. And if people are losing hope, then we should be bothered. People who cannot think as far as tomorrow aren't going to think about eternal life. They're not going to think about what's going to happen 10 years down the line. They're not going to happen five years down the line. They can't think through even today. It's a struggle whenever you lose that hope of what might happen in the future. How can you possibly prepare for the future if you have no hope whatsoever? You can't. Planning for the future depends on having hope. It's a must. And so if somebody is struggling and don't ha doesn't have much, then the mindset is changed. They become hopeless. And I'm not using the term hopeless in any flippant way. They become, become people without hope. At least in their mind. We may know that they have a hope. We may have, know they have a hope in Jesus Christ and in God. But in their mindset, they become hopeless. One of my favorite authors uh, in theology is a guy called Walter Brueggemann. And he, with a couple of colleagues, uh, wrote the following, uh, the following statement in one of their books. Poverty is not merely the absence of money. It is the absence of possibility. And the effect of living outside the consumer economy. If you give money to poor people, it helps, but is not decisive in lifting them out of the mindset and exclusion that poverty represents. Whenever you have it in your mindset that you are hopeless, you're not worth anything, that your self-esteem is so low, actually it doesn't matter what you actually throw at that person. Unless the mindset is changed from one of hopeless to somebody who has confidence and knows that they have a hope, then nothing really changes. So if we take, a, take you back to the passage, why did the person who was given least not invest? Because they couldn't think that far ahead. They couldn't think as far ahead as the master will come back. I need to cling on to what little I have so I can at least give him back that. I can't plan for the future. People who have little struggle to think ahead and think of the future. That was the first thing that struck me about the passage as I read it as an adult. The second um, is the harshness of the master. Let me just read you uh, those couple of verses again just at the end of the passage in verses 28 to 30. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more. And he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I can never remember my Sunday school teachers emphasizing that verse. I wonder why. But as an adult, we need to take notice of it and say, that's actually really harsh. This is a servant who has not wasted what he's been given. He gave back the master exactly what he'd been given. He hadn't wasted it. He hadn't spent it on other things. He was giving back exactly what he'd been given. He just hadn't invested it. He hadn't increased it. He hadn't maximized what he'd been given by the master. 
He was given back, giving back exactly what he had been given. That made me think a little bit. I think about, actually, what have I been given? I know that as a child and as a young person, as we looked at this passage, it was a matter of saying, well, this is a passage about how do you use the talents? And not necessarily money talents now, but going into the gifts that have been given. But likewise, in all of life, what is it that we have been given? What are the resources? Will it be the physical resources, our house, our income, our sort of possessions? Whether it be the gifts and skills that you've been given, how do we use them? And are we giving back to God more than he's, he's given us? Are we giving him back just exactly what he's given us? Or are we holding things back? Are we actually maybe even wasteful of those things that God has given us? That's a challenge to me. That actually, in so many ways, I am wasteful. And I need to be honest about that and say, I am wasteful. I do not use everything that God has given me to its utmost potential. If I think even just in terms of the physical resources that I've been given, the physical things that we've got, there are elements in which I'm wasteful. Things like um, in our house and our use of electricity. You know, our electricity is actually being fed by things like coal and things like that. That's actually wasting some of the earth's resources that God has given us. And yet we actually waste some of that. We aren't very good with our energy. In fact, actually, most of us haven't probably even thought about uh, our ethics or our Christian faith as we think about who we're going to get our energy with, our energy supplier. It's one thing that I've been challenged about and actually I've recently switched to a different energy supplier that only uses renewable energy as a way of thinking, actually, that Actually, this is a resource that God's given. Why am I wasting? I need to think differently about where I get my electricity from. Very practical thing. In actual fact, it's cheaper for me to actually have changed than to stay with the supplier that I was with. So it's actually been cheaper for me to go for renewable energy. Or thinking through different things uh, that we actually sort of waste. What about that food? We have one of these wee green bins next to our sink. Hands up if you have one of these little bins. Yeah. I also have three children who are aged between six and three. That bin fills up fast, as you can probably imagine. I think if you don't have children, you probably don't notice it going up quite so fast, but uh, ours does go up fast. And we have to think about that and think about, actually, what is it we are doing in our household budget that actually thinks about how we waste food? We had to, recently, whenever we were challenged by this, we had to actually go through a whole way, a different way of thinking. We used to sort of shop for the meal as it came. But actually, we had to sort of rethink all of our uh, sort of techniques. And now we actually have a menu that actually plans out all of our meals for the week. We buy it all in, on one day. We work out what needs to be eaten fresh, what needs to be frozen. And actually, we waste hardly anything. You know, the potato peelings and whatever the kids leave in their plate um, is about the only thing that goes in there. But thankfully, we're not throwing out the fresh veg, well, formerly fresh veg, uh, that tends to sort of go in and all these things because we're thinking differently. We're trying a different technique to try and not be so wasteful. Because actually, food waste is a big, big issue. Um, our supermarkets actually overstock food because they don't want you to turn up to your local Asda, Morrison, Sainsbury's, or whatever it might be, and find out that there's no bananas. So they overstock and are prepared to waste so they don't get complaints about there not being enough things in the shelves. If we stopped food waste by supermarkets and by ourselves, um, actually, because of the how much it takes to transport that food to our supermarkets, it would be the equivalent of taking 60% of the cars off the road in terms of our carbon emissions. It's a huge amount, because we don't think that actually that food, those bananas actually have come from, let's say, Rwanda, to actually be on our shelves just to go moldy. Think of the energy and the waste that that is. We need to have a different mindset uh, about it. 
What about um, other aspects of our shopping, you know, in terms of sort of buying more frozen stuff? Um, I love these programs. My wife watches them all the time. You know, the ones that sort of eat well for less or whatever it might be. And you sort of see all these tips. And you actually work out that actually buying frozen food is actually quite often even better for you than buying the fresh stuff because uh, it holds more of the nutrients in uh, and things like that. So think through, actually, maybe we're not sort of having lesser quality by actually thinking through how we're less wasteful. And what about things like our vehicles? our cars. We recently changed one of our cars and, and the, the uh, person who was kind of selling us the cars, uh, he said, okay, well, what's, what's your parameters here? What is it uh, you're looking for? And he couldn't believe it whenever we said the number one thing was low carbon emissions, you know, and good fuel efficiency. He uh, was actually stunned that he'd never actually had that as the primary purpose, you know, primary thinking behind which car to select and do that. Don't get me wrong, we've got a long way to go in terms of waste, but these are some of the steps that we've been making as a family to try and think through how are we less wasteful? Because actually, us wasting these things actually affects poor people all over the world. Climate change is estimated to cause 100 million people to go into poverty uh, in, by 2030. Uh, well, in, not even into poverty, into famine situation by 2030 because of the effects of climate change in countries all over the world. In actual fact, Ethiopia, one of the countries that we're look, looking today, or the country that we're looking at today, is severely affected by it. In Ethiopia, there's a map coming up uh, behind me, just in case you're not sure where Ethiopia is. You might still not be sure if you don't recognize any of the countries around it. Um, but Ethiopia has actually been suffering severely because of climate change. From 2015 to 2017, they had their longest drought for 50 years. They have really suffered from it, and in particular certain areas have really been challenged by that, by having that lack of enough water. What happened in 2017, right, so earlier this year, in, I think it was August this year, um, there was actually in certain areas, there was severe floods, because actually it's not necessarily that the water's not coming, it's the fact that whenever it does come, it comes all at once. And actually, it erodes the soil, damages crops, uh, and does all sorts of other things like that. And so it actually has a severe effect. So actually, my wastefulness actually impacts people overseas. It's actually people in countries like Ethiopia or Central African Republic, which you'll see mentioned often in your leaflets, um, is actually their emissions of carbon are minuscule compared to what we do, uh, what they do in terms of causing climate change is minuscule. But actually, they're the ones that are most affected by it, all the way through. Just to understand a little bit about Ethiopia and the culture of Ethiopia, uh, we're going to watch a short video. Uh, now, the video is actually, it's got a guy called Will Torrent. Hands up if you've heard of Will Torrent before. No, that was my response as well. Supposedly, he's a famous pastry chef. Um, pastry is not my, uh, my forte. I do watch Big Bake Off, uh, the Great British Bake Off, but uh, the pastry, pastry one was never my, my scene. Uh, but Will is, is quite famous in that. And actually, he goes out and actually talks to, um, to one of the people out there about actually what it means to prepare a meal in that uh, kind of condition. It gives you a bit of a flavor about what's going on. Uh, and pardon the pun with the word flavor. Uh, but please just watch a couple of minutes of this clip so you understand a little bit more. Hi, I'm Will Torrent, a pastry chef and chocolatier, and most of my weeks are spent eating, tasting, and creating lovely desserts using some of the world's finest ingredients. Uh, but this week, I'm in Ethiopia, visiting people that Tear Fund are helping to become more resilient to climate change, disasters, and droughts through their amazing work in the self-help groups. I met an amazing uh, woman called Amarich, who show me how to make in jail one of the, the classic dishes of Ethiopia. Easy, now I've got to do it. Here we go. <laughs> a fermented teff pancake, if you like, uh, cooked uh, over fire on a steel plate. <laughs> and the way that she welcomed us in to, to her home was just incredible. You're in 
Because of poverty, my husband went to another country to find work. So I was left to raise my seven children alone. Life was very difficult for us and we were affected by severe drought. We were the poorest of the poor. She was telling us that before she joined the self-help group two years ago, she didn't have enough money to clothe her kids, and so they didn't want to go to school because they were taken the mick out of. There were times when I couldn't afford to feed my children. I couldn't fulfill their basic needs, and that was what was hardest for me. When I joined the self-help group, we all started saving one barrel a week. I took a loan and started a business buying butter from this area and selling it at the market. We also learned how to manage our resources and now I breed and sell cows and save my money properly. When my life started changing, I told my husband it was possible for him to work here and convinced him to come back. Now we hope for more for a better future. She's got a smile on her face all the time, but to think just over two years ago, she was really struggling. That's the amazing work that these self-help groups are doing. Today, we've got two and a half thousand churches reaching out into their communities, 18,298 groups, 332,000 members impacting the lives of all their households. So we've got 1.7 million people now, lives being transformed the biggest problem in my community. The weather here is all mixed up. During the dry season, unexpected rain would come and destroy crops. When it should rain, it does not. And when it should be cold, we have a hot season. So everything has changed. This year, I lost all my crops. Now I don't even have seed for next season. But because of my business opportunities, I'm not just reliant on crops. I can buy seed elsewhere. But not everyone will have money to buy seed. I've seen how incredibly tough it is for people that have been affected by drought, disaster, climate change. But I've also seen the amazing hope that they have, having changed their mindset even though they're about to face more difficult times ahead. Somebody like Amaraj in, uh, in Ethiopia doesn't have the luxury of being wasteful in the same way as we do. You know, she actually does need to use the resources that are there so the question is whether she's just using them or actually maximizing them. The way Tear Fund works in places like Ethiopia, and just to put this in a bit of context, your church here, Bearsden Baptist, is actually partnered with Kaylee Haywood uh, Church in uh, Ethiopia. And we'll explain a little bit about what that is in a second uh, whenever I ask Liz a couple of questions. But the, uh, you're actually partnered with him. But one of the projects that we're actually involved in, or the key project that we're involved in, is these self-help groups. This is groups that are actually coming based from the church uh, about actually how to support each other. We as Tear Fund try not to actually go in and give bags of seeds or give things to people because actually it doesn't help the mindset change. What we actually try to do is actually try to do more of a, an approach of training people and equipping them so that they can actually survive through the challenging conditions. And one of the ways is through these self-help groups. Uh, the church in, uh, in there, in fact, let me give you an example. There's a, a self-help group called Bereket Self-Help Group, in which there's a guy called Atu, who's uh, part of the group. Now, he is a farmer. He's had a small plot of land. He's used traditional farming methods to try and actually look after the ground and grow things. But it has been a real challenge for him with the drought and the floods. And going through this cycle of drought, flood, drought, flood, the traditional methods aren't yielding much anymore. They're just becoming ineffective. So he joined this group that was part of the church. And actually what they do is, as a group, they meet weekly and they give money into a pot weekly. Uh, not a literal pot, but they, they come and they put money. For us, it might be the equivalent of about a pound a week. 
Now, if we were to give a pound a week in, you'd say, well, one pound is not very much. However, if you've got 20 people as part of a group, then actually that's 20 pound a week, that's 80 pound a month, that's 160 pound uh, two months, that's 240-ish pound by the time you get a to a quarter. And that 240 pound can then be used as a loan to members of the group in order to set up new businesses. And it's a business in which the whole group is invested in. The whole group wants it to work. So they share resources, not just the financial ones, but they share expertise about enterprise, business skills, how to actually do things. And so for somebody like Atto, who was using traditional methods that just didn't work, what he was able to do was actually, with uh, money that he was able to get as a loan from that group that he'd been putting into, he was able to actually buy scissors and actually start a barber shop. So he was able to start, uh, say barber shop in the loosest sense of the word, don't think of a red, white stripes outside a glass sort of uh, shop front. Uh, but he was able to start a new kind of hairdressing trade. And it was actually from that, was he able to start uh, getting an income in which he was able to then invest in other businesses and do that. And so he's actually been able to have an income that's actually sustainable and able to keep going and is not just rely reliant on what's coming from the ground. Amorax, you could see, is no longer just reliant on what's coming from the ground, but actually these other businesses that she's been uh, establishing. And uh, all the way through, we, we see elements of doing that. And it's not just in terms of their personal finances uh, that things are changing. Also in terms of the actual society that they're in is changing as well. Some of the self-help groups have actually decided not just to invest in what's actually happening in terms of individuals, but in terms of infrastructure. There's one group, Abraham, self-help group, uh, and sort of named after the prophet Abraham. Abraham self-help group, they actually said to the local authority, one thing that we need is to re-establish the bridge that was uh, sort of washed away by the floods. We need to re-establish that. So they actually said to the local authority, if we get that, that will really help people's lives because they'll be able to get the market more easily so they'll be able to sell things. So actually, they have been part of actually using some of that money to build a bridge. This isn't the actual bridge, but I couldn't find a picture of the actual bridge, but I'm sure it's probably a bridge similar to that. And actually build a bridge so that it can actually help not only themselves, but that bridge is going to be useful for the entire village and transform lives. It's our partners who we're doing that with. What I'd like to do is I'd like to invite Liz up to explain just a little bit about what Kaylee Haywood's doing and what she's actually seen. She's not going to sort of speak for the full length she is tonight, but this can be a taster of what's actually before you as well. You might have to turn it on. I don't know if it's on. Yes, it is. Are we on? Uh, I haven't asked you anything yet, uh, but welcome. <laughs> uh, Liz, you went out to Kelly Haywood uh, Church. Could you just, well, first of all, describe Kelly Haywood Church because your understanding as you went out and your understanding once you were there was a bit different. Yes. Um, here, here's one here. Um, Kaylee Haywood Church is the largest evangelical denomination in Ethiopia, um, I think starting back in the 1920s, um, and now they have about 9 million uh, members all over Ethiopia, um, and they have joined in partnership with, with Tia Fund through Connected Church to really um, help the poorest of the poor, we heard that phrase there and they use that quite a lot, um, in their uh, villages and in their uh, communities to set up self-help groups. And have you ever been to an area like this before? And you know, what was your first impressions whenever you arrived? Um, oh, there's me. Um, yeah, we, um, I've been to Kenya and Uganda on a hitchhiking trip when I was 25 and a bit stupid um, because it wasn't the brightest thing to do um, on my own with a friend. Uh, I don't think my poor father slept for three weeks, but anyway, that's beside the point. But So I was aware of what... Um, poverty was like in these areas. Um, but my first impressions of Ethiopia, we, we arrived in one of the flash flood rainstorms, which you can imagine was delightful. I had all my lovely summer gear, left Glasgow, and I arrived in monumental rain. Mm. Um, and the problem with that rain, of course, is because the ground is so dry, it doesn't go into the ground. 
it just washes everything away. Mm. So the streets in Addis Ababa were just like rivers. Um, it was amazing, mm. horrible. Um, yeah, and the other thing that struck me was the, the number of people. Um, one of the first things we were told, there, were, there are 109 million people in Ethiopia. I think I saw every single one of them. Mm. Um, <laughs> they are just everywhere. People just walking, sitting, lying along. I mean, just everywhere. Mm. Children. Mm. Um, it was just an incredibly busy, yeah. busy sure. place. So. And, and how challenging is it for families out there? Um, well, we saw, we saw various groups. We spent three, we spent the week with three guys, two of whom had been to university. Um, so, uh, and also this guy here, who's our taxi driver for the week. So they obviously um, have a different standard of living to some of the other people in the families that we saw. But when we were down in the rural areas where um, you see the, the groups here living, they really are the poorest of the poor. Um, <sighs> And, and for them, um, a group like the self-help group who have actually come in and helped them um, save, given them the tools with which to, to, to start a little business, um, ha has just been absolutely transforming for them. And, you know, uh, so many stories, and I'll try and tell you as many as I can tonight, of, of little businesses that have been started. And I hate to say it, but the worst thing is for us to give money and, or, or give money to, to give them mm. gifts if you like and the, they were talking about the um shoebox scheme as well please don't give us shoeboxes for christmas because it undermines us as parents mm. and so what is it that the church actually do then what's what i've said a little bit but what exactly were the church doing then if they're not giving out things then well they go in and they train the um people in their area how to um do the actual saving. They teach them how to um, keep the books, the records, because obviously they have to go to the bank with the money. Um, so they, they set up the group, um, show them how to, to, to keep the books, um, give them the tools with which to, to understand what, what this is all about, and also to, to um, get other people in their groups. So there's a lot of training, um, not just at the self-help group level, but there's above that, there's a, 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 a level called the cluster uh, association, mm -hmm. so the CLA, Cluster Leader Association, so the self-help groups have a sort of a, a group above them who are managing them and helping them, and then there's a, a level above them as a federation as well, where there's, there's more training, there's more uh, initiatives for actually getting uh, people involved in education, uh, in local government. Um, the, the local governments are setting up and taking notice of these groups. Uh, it's incredible because these women are now speaking out. They are empowered to speak out and they're helping with HIV education, uh, literacy programs. Um, have I answered the question? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, we've been talking this morning about how God calls us to maximise the resources that have been given. Yeah. How have you seen that in practice on, on the ground in Ethiopia? Well, you've spoken about already, you know, one or two people, but that it's amazing when you have very little what you what, how resourceful you become um so from the savings that they uh make the first thing a lot of them do will get a water pipe put into their home 50 percent of ethiopians do not have access to running water um so one of the things that you see a lot of are the children walking down the sides of the streets with these huge great big yellow containers going to the pump to get water um, so that one of the first things they want to do is get water into their house um, so that they can maybe start um, a business renting out a shower. So um, one woman um, bought a freezer, a little fridge freezer to make ice lollies. Um, one of the girls that we met, she'd, she'd bought scissors as well and she had a hairdressing business. Um, they use the um, local uh, grain, is called teff. It's like grass, but it has a seed on the top, and it's just everywhere. Um, and they harvest that, and they grind it down, and they make these injera pancakes that you saw. Yeah. So we saw one woman, um, again, lots of pictures tonight, if you come, making these pancakes. She works from 4 o'clock in the afternoon all night, and then makes 400 of those pancakes in searing heat, um, because it takes quite a lot of heat to make those pancakes. And she makes 400 a night. And then her husband packs them up and takes them to a local hotel where they use them 
to, so that's her business mm. and yeah. coffee as well of course is a big thing too yeah. so um, yeah. excellent yeah. is there any one story that's impacted you particularly yeah. whilst you were there mm. I think they probably all have but yeah, they have uh, I mean you were talking about hope and how mm -hmm. um, you know people lose self-esteem and how they, they they lack hope there's one picture um, Michael have you got the picture of this is Bausch Bausch to um, she is the liaison officer for her uh, group and uh, she I'm going to give you some quotes from her because she was very inspirational she is the liaison person between the group and the local government so she approaches the local government and makes representations to them about various things as I said about illiteracy programs HIV um, things like that um, and she said, I've been approached, I have been approached by govern, government officials and doors have opened to my further requests. We can be used by the government to spread information and call meetings in our networks. Our culture puts women down. We are told not to express ourselves, but here we all speak. We take turns in leading the meetings. And then she said, do not look down on our capacity. All prime ministers have a mother. <laughs> And I asked her, I said, you know, five, ten years ago, did you ever dream that you would be in this position? And she said that it, it, it's like moving from the darkness into the light. She said, I could never, ever have dreamt of, of where I am um, now. So it just brings hope, yeah. self-esteem, respect, self-respect. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. I've got a short uh, message from, uh, from Kelly Haywood actually for you that we're just going to just watch now for a, a minute. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for those uh, connected church supporters back in the UK. Uh, I want to say thank you for your support for the SSG work in Ethiopia, especially uh, through Tilfan Ethiopia and the Ethiopian Kalehot Church Development Commission. We are very grateful and we have uh, uh, much uh, 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 respect for you and uh, we are appreciating your support we have uh, more than 14,000 self-help groups uh, through a local church uh, we have um, more than um, uh, 1.2 million uh, uh, households who are organized as SSGs. We saw an amazing change, uh, life uh, uh, change, and that all is uh, because of uh, your support. So we want to say thank you, God bless you, and God bless Tirfa. And I want to reiterate that and just say thank you. Uh, on behalf of Tear Fund and on behalf of the Keeley Haywood Church, uh, thank you for your support that you do give as a congregation uh, to that ministry. Uh, and do it. I, I will confess that Tear Fund don't do very much. We try where possible in countries not to do very much because we want to work with the local church as they serve because we don't want people to look to Tear Fund and go, they're the ones who, who do this stuff. We want them to look to the local church and say, here's the place where we go. Uh, and so thank you on their behalf. But that doesn't mean that there's not things that we can do. And I would uh, sort of stress to you that, that there are things that we can do. The first thing that we can do is we can pray. Please, please, please pray for the people in Ethiopia. The whole country has been going through turmoil with uh, the famine and floods, oh, sorry, drought and floods, uh, both of which have caused famine. Please pray for them and pray for some of the individuals. Tonight, particularly, Liz will be sharing about lots of individuals Please pray for them. Remember some of their names. Remember the names of people like Ato that I mentioned today. Remember uh, people like Amaraj that we saw in the video. Pray for them. Pray for them, please. We can also change some of our actions. We can change what we do. I've mentioned about the effects of climate change that we are guilty of as well. Think about what it is we're doing. I've just given you some examples of ways in which we as a family, as my family, have actually tried to be less wasteful and uh, think about climate change, but you can do the same as well. And then as a church, you're already giving, but you can also sort of give individually as well if you want to try and support our work. Um, I have just left the, the leaflets on, uh, on sort of a few chairs dotted around. If you don't have one in your chair and you want one, there's ones at the table at the, the back uh, there. 
what we'd say is any money donated through the Christmas appeal this year in November, December, and January will be doubled. The UK government will match it pound for pound. Uh, so this is a time we've never had this opportunity before as tier fund uh, as well. So if you think, uh, I'd love to give, I don't know when to give, now is the time, actually. Um, uh, now is the ideal time because we can actually double it. So we would really appreciate it if you considered that as well. But let's, be, uh, before we do anything else, let's just um, have some closing worship. But let me pray as the band uh, come up. Father, just thank you that you are making a difference in people's lives. We thank you for local churches up and down the country. We thank you how, for how you use the local church uh, to be your witness in many places around the world. And we do just ask that you will show us how we can be part of that global church that isn't wasting what you've given us, but instead is maximizing what you've given us in order to bring people hope. To give them a mindset change that they can think of the future. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.